Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 10e of Useful Genetics, where we're going to talk about the origins of sex chromosome aneuploidies, that is, of individuals who have inappropriate numbers of the sex chromosomes, too many or too few of the X chromosome or the Y chromosome. We'll talk about the types and frequencies of these sex chromosome amnuploidies, and then we'll talk about how they arise, which is not what you would think based on how autosomal amnuploidies arise. So here are the frequencies again in our table of abnormalities per 100,000 pregnancies. And now we're focusing on the sex chromosome amnuploidies. And you'll see there's several kinds listed. You can have an X and two Ys, or two Xs and a Y. These individuals are phenotypically male because they have a Y chromosome. Or you can have a single X, monosomy X, or multiple copies of an X and no Ys. These individuals are phenotypically female. Um, their numbers of, among live births are moderately high. Um, only the monosomy X, which is Turner syndrome, has very high numbers among spontaneously aborted fetuses. We'll talk about this more in the next lecture. Um, I've marked again how often they arise and how well they survive to birth. That'll be in the next lecture. Now, one reason we treat sex chromosome aneuploidy separate from the others is because they originate in a different way. And that was very clearly illustrated by this um, recent paper about the origins of sex chromosome aneuploidies. And the authors concluded that 70-80% of sex chromosome monosomies appeared to be caused by loss of a paternal sex chromosome, not a maternal sex chromosome. So these are errors in the father's germline not the mother. Now, here's the data. And I've simplified the table. So first, what the authors did, they looked at 376 people who had sex chromosome aneuploidies, and they analyzed their sex chromosomes to see which parent they had come from. And using that information, they were able to draw conclusions about whether the error happened in a maternal meiosis or in a paternal meiosis, and whether it happened in meiosis 1 or meiosis 2, or whether it happened to a maternal chromosome at an unknown stage or after meiosis was complete. Same here for the paternal chromosomes. So here's the data. There's quite a lot of numbers. Um, I'll draw a line down here to indicate separating the maternal and paternal numbers. But what I want you to notice is that there are some big numbers on the paternal side. So for all of the cases um, except trisomy for X, most of the errors happened in the father's meiosis, not the mother's meiosis. And they're, they're substantial numbers. Now, why would this be? Why would errors be happening in the father's meiosis? We talked about errors in the mother's meiosis because of the very long period that the oocytes are arrested in the middle of meiotic metaphase. But that doesn't happen in fathers. They're making gametes very fast all the time. Something else is going wrong in fathers. And I'm going to illustrate it with some slides from Module 7. Um, in the very last lecture of Module 7, we talked about how meiosis happens differently for sex chromosomes. And the first thing we said was, well, it doesn't happen differently for the X chromosomes. That in females, it doesn't happen differently for the X chromosome in females. In females have two X chromosomes and they pair exactly like autosomes. And they cross over exactly like autosomes. So we expect in female meiosis, which is, involves the two X chromosomes, that the frequency of X chromosome aneuploidies arising from errors in the mother would be similar to that 
of the frequency of aneuploidies for any other autosome of a similar size, which is fairly low. In contrast, when we think about how meiosis happens in males for the sex chromosomes, we have this problem, how do the X and Y chromosomes go to the opposite poles of the cell? Because normally that requires that a chromosome pair with its homolog so that they're held together by crossovers and the spindle fibers can align them at the center of the cell and then split the pair up. But the X and Y chromosomes in males don't have any homologs. What they do is they pretend to be homologs by having sequences at the very tips of the chromosomes that are in fact homologous. And they're called, the, you'll remember, they're called the pseudo-autosomal regions at the tips of the short arms and the tips of the long arms of the X and Y chromosomes. And these truly homologous sequences pair with each other in meiosis in exactly the same way that the homologous regions of autosomes pair in meiosis. The only difference is that it's kind of, because the chromosomes are of different length, for their tips to come together, the X chromosome has to sort of scrunch over, kind of like a really tall woman going out with a very short man. Um, and at the time when I taught this in Module 7, we noted that an X chromosome crossover, an XY crossover, is obligate in male meiosis. At least one occurs every meiosis. And we said if these crossovers did not occur, the X and Y chromosomes would not separate properly because they're not tied together by a crossover on the metaphase plate. When we presented this in lecture 7R, the emphasis was on the obligate crossover. But now I want to emphasize instead what happens when there isn't a crossover. Because sort of in contrary to what I said then, sometimes there isn't a crossover. Sometimes the cell just doesn't get its act together. And there isn't a crossover between the X and the Y. And when that happens, the X and the Y do not segregate properly. They drift around, unmoored, and just by chance they may both wind up in the same cell, leaving the other cell with no sex chromosome. And that's how male meiotic errors give rise to sex chromosome aneuploidies. And that's why it happens much more frequently in the male meiosis than in the female meiosis. So what we've done, we've talked about how sex chromosome aneuploidies arise by errors in male meiosis as a consequence of the only very short pairing regions available to these chromosomes and thus the higher probability that they'll fail to cross over and that this will cause missegregation and generating an aneuploid sperm which will give rise to an aneuploid zygote. Coming up next, we're going to think about the phenotypes of people with sex chromosome aneuploidies because these again deserve some special consideration. I hope to see you there.